Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous, so we've given him an alternate name. Adam, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here, Vic. Uh, Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. You know, I appreciate it. Adam, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay. I live in the great state of Oklahoma. I've lived here for the last 21 years total. Uh, And before that, I lived in Texas for about 10 years and then about nine or 10 years in Oklahoma before that. So we kind of started here, went to Texas and came back. I've worked in the oil field for the last, I don't know, eight or nine years. I drove a Schwann's truck. I've dug ditches. I've shoveled cow poo. You name it, I've done a little bit of everything. I mean, I've done pipeline, was a uh, x-ray technician doing inspections on uh, welds and on pipelines and refineries. Now I'm inspecting uh, drilling equipment. I'm enjoying my job. I love it. I work a lot of hours and it's keeping me busy. <laughs> Before that, back when I was, uh, I guess about 21, I, I went to a gunsmithing school and graduated from there and worked for a few years in Memphis, Tennessee as a full-time gunsmith and then uh, moved back here. And I've been doing it off and on as a hobby, but hopefully I'll open up my own shop before too long and uh, be able to get back into doing that. I'm married. I don't have any kids. Well, we got the dogs and the cats, so those are my kids. <laughs> uh, I love to go fishing. Uh, used to do trapping and uh, hunting, but I have some hearing issues and uh, I can't hear anything moving around me really like birds and insects and so forth. And if you can't hear when they go silent, then you could be in a world of hurt. You do realize, Adam, that in the dictionary next to the terms well-rounded, there's a picture of you. You understand that, don't you? Yeah, I'm working on trying to get that round shape down. <laughs> huh. Oh, no, you'll get there. Adam, you had your first sighting when you were 10. Do you think that experience had any notable effects on shaping who you are today? Well, it, it made me a little more aware of trying to pay attention to what's going on around me at night. The encounter happened at night, and you know it made me take notice of a few things that were kind of odd in the area and started making a little more sense after I had my first encounter. Yeah, I mean, it it affected me. It made me start looking at my surroundings a little more. Oh, I bet it did. Did you believe in cryptids before you had that first encounter? Yes, I did. When I was in grade school, there was a uh, program that they had where they would put out a, a flyer with lists of books in it. And they had a van that would come around, oh, once a semester. And you could pick out books for, I was like, maybe a nickel or a dime a piece. And I got one on Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster. I think there's some alien stories in there. And uh, the Bigfoot one, it covered the Teddy Roosevelt incident. And it it talked about some, I think they were hunters or trappers up on, uh, it ended up being Vancouver Island up there in Canada, which had the name of Ape Island. And it's kind of funny because I went on a cruise out of Seattle two or three years ago up to an Alaskan cruise and uh, we sailed right by it. (laughs) And they said, Oh yeah, right here off the uh, starboard bow is uh, Vancouver Island. I'm like, well, wait a minute, Vancouver Island, that's Ape Island. Oh my gosh. That's where all that happened. (laughs) That was pretty interesting. But I've always felt that there's things in, in the world that we can't explain. And that's basically, you know, what the cryptids are, something we can't explain. So, I mean, they found a uh, fish off the coast of Madagascar that's supposedly been extinct for millions of years, and they're thriving. You know, 100-something years ago, the great apes and the giant pandas were myths. 
but they were discovered. And those are extremely recent in uh, the animal kingdom as being proven. So I don't see any reason why there can't be cryptids out there. Online, a lot of people were saying, oh, we're encroaching on their territory. That's why we're seeing more coyotes in town or whatever, or seeing mountain lions or bobcats in town. Well, get in an airplane and fly across the United States and tell me if we're encroaching on anything. <laughs> there is hundreds of thousands of acres out there that there is nothing. There's places that humans probably haven't even stepped foot yet. So absolutely, yes, I believe there are Bigfoots out there. I believe that dog man is out there, maybe even black panthers. I don't think they're cougars, but they're something else. But yeah, yeah, I, I believe in cryptids. Well, my vote is for all the above. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if all three are out there and more. A lot more than most people would ever be comfortable knowing about. When you think about how your life played out after having your encounters, can you think of any positive things that resulted from it? Yeah, I was more open-minded. I've always had an interest in science, so there for a long time I thought, there has to be rhyme and reason for everything. If you see something, there's got to be a scientific explanation for it. Well, the scientific explanation that I get for cryptids is it's something we haven't discovered yet, or the right people haven't discovered it yet, I suppose. Because, I mean, as, as many sightings as there's been, and the scientific community is, is shunning cryptozoology, that just seems weird because if they're not the, the people who are, you know, the, uh, uh, what the, the worst word I'm looking for, the people in the know in the scientific community are not accepting that people are seeing things and dismissing it outright. There has to be something to that. Because I mean, these are the people who are supposed to be formulating theories and so forth, you know, trying to gain knowledge. And when these people are coming up and saying, hey, you know, we, we saw an eight foot bipedal animal in the, in the woods. Oh, you didn't either. You know, what's the phrase? They're biting off their own nose, to spite their face. Yeah, sounds like they are. It really is a shame that when you have people like that in the scientific field who are so close minded, it's really self-defeating with the work they do. All right, Adam, please tell us about all of your experiences, except the one that happened to you in 93. And then, please tell us about all the experiences that have been shared with you. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Well, when I was uh, 10 years old, my grandparents worked on a ranch out in the Texas Panhandle. And if anybody's ever been out there, there's not a lot out there. I mean, you've got jackrabbits, uh, pump jacks, and uh, power lines, pretty much, and the occasional uh, prairie dog town. Well, this place, uh, the, the guy that owned the ranch, he had, I want to say it was like 14 to 15 sections. It was out there in the middle of nowhere. Well, the bedroom that I had when I would stay out there was on the uh, southeast corner towards the front of the house. And this house was probably built, I want to guess, in the 20s or 30s. So it had a pretty big concrete foundation with a basement. And it had the really tall wooden frame windows, the ones that had the uh, the rope with the pulley and the, the weight inside the wall. One night before I went to bed, we had a uh, thunderstorm roll in and the thunder and lightning and rain going sideways because there's no trees out there to really slow it down. And uh, for what a reason I woke up and I'm laying there in bed, the room's lighting up from the uh, lightning. And I turn and look at the window and about that time, some lightning flashed, and it looked like a dog was reared up on the window, and it had its snout up, because I could see its snout. And then when the lightning stopped flashing, the room went dark again. Well, the next round of lightning flash, whatever it was, had dropped its head down. I could see the ears. There were pointed ears up on top of its head. Then when that lightning faded and then the next round of lightning came up it was gone that window sill was probably from the outside back then i could grab it and pull myself up to look in so it was probably about five feet off the ground the top of the window was probably it was probably about a four foot tall window so about 
about nine feet up was the very tip top of the uh, the window. So this thing would have been seven and a half, to probably eight foot tall. And another thing that was kind of odd about the house, all the windows were nailed shut. You could not open the windows at all. The old man that owned the place, he would never be outside after dark. Sun start touching the horizons when he'd come in. And he wouldn't go outside for nothing. Now, I told my grandpa that I saw a dog in the reared up on the side of the house in the window that night for the next morning. And he's like, oh, it's just your imagination. It's probably the tree. Well, the tree was about 50 feet away. My uh, next encounter was probably a Sasquatch encounter. I was maybe 11 or 12, and we were still living in Texas at the time. We came back to, uh, came out here to Oklahoma, down in uh, south central Oklahoma. And we were camping on this pond. My dad knew the uh, the owner, and they had a little general store down there. And so when we got there, we went and bought supplies for him, got the key to the gate, and went in and uh, got everything set up. Well, the day before we left to go out there, my grandpa, who had grown up in that area there in south central Oklahoma, he said, well, when you get out there, watch out for them wood boogers. And my dad said, uh, I don't listen to him. He's just pulling your leg. Well, we get out there, and I, I want to say probably the second or third night, you know, we'd let the fire die down, and I was crawling in my sleeping bag, and something screamed. And, of course, you know, I, I jump up, and I'm rolling the covers down on the on the tent and hiding under the cot, and my dad's like, oh, it's just that was a peacock. They got peacocks over there. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that thing screamed all night and every other night, and uh, got tired. Actually, I, Got the point where I'd you know, go to the tent and I'd yell, shut up, you stupid bird. <laughs> but here's the weird thing, though. About four or five years ago, I was working on a pipeline as a uh, x-ray technician. And we ended up working on the exact same property that my dad and I went camping on. And the guy that had it then still owns it now. And I was talking to him one day and I said, yeah, those peacocks you had back then, those things scared the crap out of me screaming all night he kind of looked at me funny and said man i've never owned peacocks he said i got an idea what you heard but it wasn't a bird i was like well what do you think it was and he says well you don't want to see it <laughs> but yeah that one that encounter scared me pretty good because I've, I've never really didn't want to go out at night but that pretty much uh sealed the deal on me going outside at night <laughs> Before we moved to Texas, my uh, grandma came out to visit us, and Dad was on the road somewhere working. And uh, I think he was, um, I'm not really sure where he went. But anyway, um, my grandma was sleeping in the bed with my mom, and at the east side of the house, or east side of their room, there was a tall window, which was actually right above the headboard. And it was just like a rectangular window, that just just for letting light in because it, it, it wouldn't open. Well, anyway, mom sits up in the bed, shakes my grandma and says, look at that dog, look it in the window and then lay down and went back to sleep. Well, my grandmother's was part Native American and she was super, like, extremely superstitious and she couldn't go to sleep the rest of the night. She kept looking up at the window, trying to see the dog looking in. <laughs> so, that could have been just, you know, mom having a dream or she actually saw something looking in the window. But that window would have been probably about eight or nine feet up from the outside. When I lived in Tennessee, there was a uh, an area out there called uh, off the Hatchie River. that had a uh, some public hunting land out there. And I went out there and hunted quite a bit, but never saw or heard anything that would make me think there was a cryptid running around out there. But uh, there's some shows on uh, YouTube that, you know, say there are that people have had a lot of encounters out there. I guess I got lucky and didn't run into anything on that one. Yeah, after I moved back to Oklahoma, I was working in a gun shop out here. And one of the things that people always talk about cryptid wise, I hear are Black Panthers. There was a, a gentleman that came into the gun shop I was in and uh he says, hey, I, I want some of them exploding broadheads like Rambo used in that movie. 
well, we proceed to tell him, so yeah, that's movie magic, man. Those things don't exist. <laughs> and he says, well, I, I need some night vision because I got a pack of them Black Panthers running around out there. And I was like, really? And then, you know, cats don't run in packs, man. They, they're they solitary. And he said, well, there's, there's four or five of them running together and they're big. And I'm like, well, where do you see them? He said, well, I see them at night. And he said, I got them on my trail camera. And I'm like, okay, cool, man. Let's, I want to see them. He said, well, the computer crashed, lost the pictures. I'm like, oh, okay. Man. He, but he's like, yeah, I want a night vision scope for my gun. And so I, I can start shooting them because they're killing my, killing my livestock. And either he didn't report it or it was hushed up because never really heard anything about uh, people's livestock getting killed out here. But yeah, I would have, I would have really liked to have seen what kind of pictures he had if he had had any. My next encounter happened uh, about five, six years ago. We were down around, actually pretty close to where my dad and I had gone camping that time. But we were probably about 10 miles south of there. On a pipeline right away, there is all kinds of noise. You've got track hose, you've got trucks, you've got power tools, uh, grinders, diesel engines, all kinds of noise, people yelling. It's just a lot of noise. You can always hear something. Well, we were covering, I think, three different sites, the pipeline, and I think maybe two or three uh, well pads that we were having to go and x-ray equipment on. Well, one of those days we had to go to another site. We spent all day over there. Well, the welders on the pipeline probably got, I don't know, 40 or 50 welds ahead of us. So we went in on a Sunday to uh, get caught up while they were gone. Get out there and, you know, there's zero noise. I mean, other than the uh, noise coming from the, the animals and the birds chirping and so forth. Didn't really notice that there was any birds or not, because I, I do have some hearing issues. But what we were doing is uh, we were leaving the truck up on the high spot, so we still have self-signal. And uh, we had a Yamaha Rhino that we would run to where we were x-raying, and one of us would run film back and forth. Well, that day, the guy I was working with was running the film and processing it at the truck. And uh, he uh, would come back about every 30, 40 minutes to pick up the film that I had shot. Anyway, he had left and I was there maybe 10 minutes just, just shooting away, shooting welds. And uh, I hear, it sounded like somebody took a big, like a Louisville slugger and hit a tree. Then it was off to my right. And then for on the left side, further down, I heard another one. And then a few minutes later, I heard one behind me. Then a few minutes later, I heard the one off to my right again. And I thought, okay, that's kind of weird. Somebody's out here messing around in the woods. And uh, I heard something, heard a ping. And I thought, what in the world was that? And what had happened is uh, something had hit the pipe. And I heard it behind me. I heard, I heard a clang or a ping behind me. And I turned around. And there was a rock rolling across the ground. So somebody was up there throwing rocks at me. And uh, anyway, about that time, John comes rolling up on the uh, rhino. I was like, hey, you out there messing around in the woods? And he goes, no, man, I just left the truck and drove down. And uh, I'm like, okay, well, there's somebody out here messing around. And he said, man, I haven't seen anybody. We're the only ones out here. It's like, okay, well, hang around if you miss, you might hear it. And he said, well, okay. Well, of course, didn't hear nothing. And he heads back up the hill. And probably about five, ten minutes later, I heard another knock. And uh, it, it was further away. And that was the last one I heard that day. But uh, a couple of years ago, I was on uh, working at a refinery. And I was watching videos on YouTube. And if you don't turn that autoplay off, man, you'll go down all kinds of rabbit holes, I mean, <laughs> all kinds. But that's where I found out about David Polites and uh, Missing 411 and and all that. And then I found out he had done a, uh, a book called The Hoopa Project. And he was talking about that. So I, like, it, it re-sparked my interest in Bigfoot. And uh, he uh, was talking about tree knocks and the various shows I listened to. 
you know, one of the things they always talk about was tree knocks and somebody played an audio of it. And I don't remember which video they had that on, but they played it and I'm like, whoa, hey, I've, I've heard that. I heard that out there on that pipeline. And I was like, wow. And I was like, man, that, that's what I heard. And then I remember back to that camping trip with my dad, my grandpa was talking about the wood boogers and, and all that. And I was like, man, yeah, he was right. <laughs> but yeah, my wife's boss, where their house is at, they've got a big bay window on the south side and a big field out there, probably. Uh, it's, I'm not 100% sure how big to go. I'm just going to, I'm going to guess it, you know, 15 acres that's been cleared off. He would always say that every once in a while he'd see the pack of coyotes run through there, that there's a supersized big black wolf out there, a lot bigger than the coyotes. And he said he saw it, you know, several times. And that's actually less than half a mile from where I live is where that field's at. <laughs> so, so it seems like I've got dog men here also. My grandmother told me a story about something that happened when she was a young girl. And so this would have been in the late twenties, early thirties, probably there was a married couple that had a house out in the country down there around is in South central Oklahoma. It was uh, either Calvin or Carson. But anyway, they were, they were close to those, one of those towns and she was in the backyard hanging laundry on the clothesline. And she had her, her newborn in a uh, bassinet on the back porch. Well, I believe she said that, you know, the mail carrier came by or somebody was at the front door and she went by, checked on her baby, went through the house, went out the front. And when she came back, the baby was gone and they looked and never found anything. I mean, looked for days and never found anything. And my grandmother said it was a black panther. But see, my opinion on that is, I mean, Mountain lions don't have the uh, the melanistic gene. They'll get you know light tan, dark brown, but the, you'll never see a cougar actually turn black. They don't have the melanism gene in their DNA. If it's a black panther, then it's not a uh, mountain lion. It's something else. It's another cryptid. I've also heard that it's possible that people are misidentifying dog men as black panthers or that they're when they they see something their their mind tries to rationalize what they're looking at and the first thing that pops in the head okay that that's a black panther and they go with that but that that's my opinion on black panthers i mean they're probably not a cougar they're something else they're a big cat but they're they're not a mountain lion there was a story in the local paper there was a, a couple who had camped right off Interstate 40 at the Seminole exit. And they're, they said they were attacked by big wolves. And the story was in the paper. I haven't been able to locate it. County was called out, but their official word was, uh, it was uh, coyotes. Well, coyotes are little. <laughs> you know, they, they don't get very big. I mean, 50 pound coyotes, a big coyote for around here. I mean, I know they get bigger elsewhere, you know, up, upwards of probably 60 or 70, but a 50 pound coyote's a big coyote here. And the way the story sounded is something big tore up their campsite and scared the, the living crap out of them. So, but that happened uh, right there off 540 and uh, Highway 99, which would have been exit 200. And there there is a campground right there, but I think they were on the west side behind the casino camp back there somewhere those poor people life's never going to be the same for them again oh no <laughs> no yeah unfortunately now that you've told us about all those other experiences that have happened to you as well as the experiences that have been shared with you please tell us about the encounter you had in 93 okay back in 1993 this would have been probably I I think it was either May or June because I think I, I was going to uh, the local college out here and I think I had finished up finals and 
one of the guys I knew down in Colgate calls me up and says, hey, man, we've got a big party going on. Why don't you come on down? I'm like, all right, I'm there. So uh, I headed down there. Of course, the party kind of fizzled before it ever started. So it, I was down there, and we are trying to figure out what to do. And Bobby was like, hey, man, uh, let's go fishing out here outside of town. And he said, I'll get my buddy here. We'll call him Fred. Fred's got a little pickup, and we'll head out there. I'm like, okay. Well, being an Oki, man, I've, I've always got fishing pole and tackle box. And I wasn't 21 at the time, but I had a uh, replica cap and ball revolver. It was a 44 caliber brass frame that I picked up in a pawn shop, uh, I think in Duncan, Oklahoma. But anyway, I had that in my bag with all the powder caps and uh, cap ball and lube for it. I had that in my uh, tackle box. Well, we get out there and we headed out north of town and went. Three or four miles, I believe, up, and then the road made a right-hand turn to the east, and we stopped on a uh, bridge over this creek, and uh, we had the lights of the truck shining across the bridge because none of us had a flashlight. <laughs> Always be prepared, right? But anyway, we were out there, and it was pretty dark. I mean, it may have been like maybe a crescent moon because I mean, you could you could kind of see the the tree line along the edge of the water for a few feet, and then you could definitely see the road. You could see where the road was and where the fields were. There, there was enough color contrast between them that they showed up pretty good. Well, anyway, we were out there and we weren't catching nothing. We were trying to catch flatheads. So we were using uh, chicken livers and stink bait. And we're out there fishing and uh, we hear something splash in the creek. As dark as it was, I'm, I I want to guess maybe... 150, 200 yards down, we heard it. And then we heard some trees being pushed around and shook and stuff like that. And we're like, man, what in the world is that? Well, anyway, we're kind of, you know, whispering back and forth because we're trying to listen what it was. And uh, we start hearing noises closer, you know, splashing and uh, sound like limbs breaking and stuff like that. And then we start hearing something growling. and real deep deep growl and it would last probably and if i was to guess probably 30 seconds and then we would hear nothing and then you know a few minutes later we start hearing splashing and trees being shook and stuff and it was getting closer and it got pretty loud i mean it was a lot close by the time we decided to pack it up and go it got really really loud and uh you know friends like man uh we probably need to go so we started reeling our lines and putting stuff in the bed of the truck. And this was a little S10 pickup. So it wasn't very big. And there were the three of us, I'm 6'1 or 6'2, depending on which uh, gas station I'm walking out of. But uh, Bobby and Fred were a lot bigger than me. So we pretty tight in the cab. Well, anyway, as we're loading up, whatever this was, I mean, it, by this point, it was almost to the bridge and it was growling and you hear stuff shaking, you hear it moving, splashing. And Bobby's like, man, you better get that pistol loaded. And I'm like, no, man, it's not loaded. And he said, man, you better load it up. Don't want to get caught out here if that thing pops up and whatever that is pops up and we don't have any way to defend ourselves. I'm like, all right. So I, I climb in the back of the truck and Fred had actually turned the truck around and backed onto the bridge so we could load our stuff up. So the truck was now facing to the uh, west. Well, he when he stopped, he killed it, shut the key off. Uh, why, I have no idea. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm in the bed of this truck, digging in my toolbox. And the thing with the cap and ball revolver is you've got the original design, the Colt 1851, for example. You've got and even the 1873, you've got four clicks. You've got a, uh, I think what they call a loading notch, half cock, safe, and then full cock. So when you pull the hammer back, you hear four clicks. Anyway, you pull the hammer back and your cylinder starts free spinning. Uh, you dump your powder. You're supposed to measure it. I was in a hurry. So I, I was just dumping powder in the, the holes as I was turning the cylinder. And I'm pretty sure I overloaded it quite a bit. But uh, anyway, I got the powder dumped and I started dropping the 
that ball's in there and I'm, I'm doing this as fast as I can. And all I've got is the, uh, the light from the third brake light. Cause, uh, Fred was trying to get the truck started and it wouldn't start and he had his foot on the brake. And I finally get the, get the ball seated and I'm, I look over the tailgate and I see something moving at the end of the bridge and it's big. And it appeared to be all on all fours. <clears throat> and I pull the tin out that has the uh, percussion caps that go on the nipples on the back of the cylinder. And I'm trying to get those seated on there. And I drop the tin and the caps just go everywhere. So I get further down in the bed and I'm basically almost crawling around trying to find these caps. And by the time something hits the truck and I look up and I see the hump of this thing across the shoulders, the, the hump on the shoulders as it's walking around the truck on the driver's side. And the whole time that I realize Bobby and Fred are, are screaming, you know, shoot it, shoot it, get the truck started. And that's, that's the G rated version of what was actually being said. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, it goes around the front and it, it's bumping the truck as it's going along. And I finally get the last cap on there and I feel the truck bump from the right. And I look over and I see the hump and I was like, oh, crap. And it raised, starts raising up. And Fred still got the, uh, his foot on the brake. So, I mean, everything's lit up with the red brake light. And I, I look, I see the ears come up and I see this gigantic head. I see the eyes, the nose, the teeth. And this thing's growling the whole time it's walking around the truck. But anyway, it's growling and it starts rolling up the lips. I see the, see the teeth, man. They're, they're huge. Uh, all sharp pointed and, I don't know what color its eyes were because it was, it was in the red, the head, the, 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 the third brake light was putting a red glow on everything back there. And when it started, was starting to stand up, I had, I had both hands on the revolver and those, if, if you hold the trigger back, you pull the hammer back and let it go and just keep pulling the hammer back. That's what's called fanning the hammer. And, I raised the gun, pointed at it, pulled the hammer back and let it go. First shot, I'm, I'm pretty sure I hit it. Uh, it. It screamed, and I just kept fanning that hammer. And they, I, the thing with black powder guns, that first shot, you, you're going to see what you're shooting at that first shot. Everything after that, you're not going to see because of all the smoke. So I, I, I may have just sprayed bullets, the other five everywhere else. I mean, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know if I hit him more than once or not, but it, it screamed and I heard it hit the other side of the bridge and I heard it splash in the water on the north side and take off down the creek. And that was about the time that uh, Fred got the truck started. He hammered down on it and I about rolled out the back, rolled out the back of the truck and he hit that curve and almost went out the other side and finally got hole of something just hung on till we got back to town and uh we got back and you know, they're freaking out i'm freaking out and he's like what what in the world was that and i was like man i don't know it, it i said it looked like a werewolf and he said man those things don't exist and i was like yeah tell me about it and uh we so we decided pretty much decided I mean, it, it had to have been a big dog but that was that was no dog. Uh, well, I got calm, we got calmed down enough that you know, I, I got we went back to my car and loaded my stuff up and I went home. I haven't been back there since, and you know, you'd have to tie me up and drag me back to that place for me to even go back there. Uh, yeah. I get chills just thinking, just, just talking about it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you do. And for good reason. Since that dogman was so close to you when you were in the bed of that truck, please describe how it looked for us as accurately as you can. Okay. Well, it had the, uh, ha had the hump that everybody sees when it's on all fours. Um, when it started raising up, the first thing I, I, I could actually really see well was the ears on top of its head and they were uh they're pointed i mean it, it looked 
kind of a in between like a German Shepherds and a, and a crop the crop years on a Doberman. I mean, they, they, I didn't really notice how much hair was in them or any tufts on the end, but I mean it was such just a brief instant that I saw it. Um, uh, I, I don't know what color the eyes were. I mean, everything was, was bathed in the red, uh, tail light from the third brake light. Um, uh, it had, you know, dog's nose. The, when it first started up, I mean, I, I could see the teeth before it even started curling. So they were protruding teeth. Uh, it curled his lip up and I could see, you know, the, the, the front teeth, the big canines, top there, Top and bottom, uh, even the, even the, the the teeth in between, the the front teeth in between the canines were looked sharp. Uh, it, it was all black. The uh, couldn't really tell what how long the snout was because he's looking directly at me, but he had a pretty good snout on him. Uh, it, his head was man. It, 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 pretty wide i mean if i was to put a at least a foot maybe more uh, but, I, but i only saw him like in a, just maybe two three four seconds for a raised gun pulled the trigger on him and after that all i saw was smoke uh had pretty wide shoulders um uh, i mean it, I didn't get to see that much of the musculature that everybody talks about. So he was still kind of raising up. Uh, and I was probably the end of the muzzle was, I want to say probably less than a foot from the end of his nose when I pulled the trigger on him. Yeah. So I know I know I hit him with the first one. <laughs> so definitely not definitely uh definitely the poster child for what not to do to one. <laughs> yeah. Did he use the truck to help him stand up or did he stand up unaided? You know, I don't think he used the truck. Um it's possible he pushed off on the tire because he had uh Fred had pretty wide tires on this little S ten. Uh but I don't remember seeing his hand on the bed uh, or the, the rail bed rail of the truck. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think I heard any popping that people have, have reported. Uh, of course, then again, you had, I had, uh, Billy and Bobby screaming in the truck, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, all I could hear out of them was get it started, shoot it, get it started, shoot it. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course I could hear it growling. I mean, it is like it, it vibrated my, my insides. It was so loud. Oh, I bet it did. If you wouldn't have shot him in the face like that, Adam, do you think he would have attacked you? Well, after talking with you in the pre interview and what other people have, uh, reported probably not uh you know like like everybody have said you know you know if, if it wants you it will get you and you won't have you won't have any any say in the matter so yeah i i probably shouldn't have shot it but you know it is what it is uh if i now I, oh i guess on a good note i'm pretty sure i didn't hit him with the other five <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, pretty, pretty sure I didn't. Well, I like to think I'm a, I'm a fairly decent shot, so I'll, I'll, I'll say I hit him twice. <laughs> For the people listening who think you just misidentified a large dog, what would you say to them? Well, if somebody figured out a way to crossbreed a German Shepherd with Andre the Giant, then yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, I've been around Anatolian shepherds. I've been, I've seen, uh, what are those, uh, cane corsos. I've seen great Danes. 
yeah, they they were they're not near the size of this thing was. If I if I was to guess when it was walking on all fours, it was probably uh, close to five feet at the hump. Yeah, I could see it over the over the rail of the truck, and I was I was sitting down on kneel down, sitting down in the bed of the truck trying to load that pistol. And yeah, and I could see it, you know, over the rail of the truck. I see a pretty good portion of it. That's pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely doesn't sound like any dog to me. <laughs> no, sir. Yeah, imagine that. You found a strange print one time while trapping. What more can you tell us about that? Okay. Um, yeah, that's actually that's about half a mile from my house where I found that. The people that own the land have a uh, Anatolian Shepherd, and he's a big boy. He he probably weighs 150 or more. I think he did weigh more, but they put him on a diet because uh, he, he likes to eat. <laughs> but uh, I was out there trapping, running my trap line, and uh, I came across a print next to a coyote set. And this thing was huge. I mean, it was I could lay my hand on it, my fingers closed, and I could see the print on either side of my hand. So it was a good probably five inches across at least. And uh, I called my wife. I said, hey, uh, the Anatolian, has he been out? And she's like, no, he's in here in his pen, you know, asleep. He, had, he hadn't been outside the pen in probably two months. Like, no, okay. And I hung up and went on. And, uh, but yeah, it was every bit of five inches across. Uh, it was big. Yeah, that is pretty big. When you got back to Seminole after shooting that dog, man, did you have a strong urge to share your experience with friends and family, or did you just want to keep it to yourself and try to forget about it? I kept it to myself. You know, after we got back to Colgate and right before I got in my car, we, I said, man, what, what do we do? And he said, man, we, he says, I'm not saying a word. And I'm like, well, all right. And that, that's actually the last time I saw those two guys. So I don't know if they've, I don't even know where they're at now. But when I got home, now I, I didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, I actually kind of just pushed it back and recessed it a little bit, I guess. And uh, I was out on the road working. And you know, like I said, you start watching YouTube. And if you don't turn that autoplay feature off, man, you would not believe the amount of all the different rabbit holes you'll end up going down. And uh, like I said, I came across uh, David Polites and uh, Missing 411, and that went into the Bigfoot radio shows. And actually, the term dog man I heard on one of David Polites' shows, or it may have been a recording of one of his interviews. Somebody from the audience, he was taking questions from the audience, and somebody said, well, do you think it's uh, dog man doing it? And he goes, no, I do not believe in dog man. It does not exist. And I was like, wait a minute, what's a dog man? So I, I Googled it and I'm like, holy crap, that's what I saw. As a matter of fact, I think I saw the uh, the image that you have on your website and uh, your YouTube channel. And uh, I started listening and I started episode one. I've listened to every single one of them, but started uh, following it on Facebook and other places. And I didn't really start talking about it till probably a couple of years ago. And that was just a very, just a very small handful of people. Uh, matter of fact, uh, where I work now, there's uh, we've got people from all over the world and I, I have about an hour, an hour, 20 minute commute from my home to work every, just going there, uh, just drive, driving to work is an hour and 20 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes back. So I get, I got plenty of time and, you can only listen to so much uh, radio for you want to start listening to something else. So I, that's when I got uh, uh, the uh, the Dogman Encounters app and started listening to the podcast on while I'm driving. And I noticed the episode with, uh, I think his name was Dion. He was from Guatemala. And uh, he was talking about uh, running into a Cadejo. Well, we've got a guy that where I work who's from Guatemala. And he, he really, really nice gentleman. He, 
I do anything for him. He's a great guy. Uh, so anyway, I, I approached him and said, Hey man, uh, you ever heard, heard of a Cadejo? He looks at me and he says, Cadejo? I'm like, no, 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 no. Cadejo. He goes, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a, that's a hairy demon. I'm like, really? What can you tell me about? It? He says, where did you hear that? And I said, well, it, I heard about it on this thing called Dogman Encounters and uh, showed it to him. He's like, yeah, yeah, man, we got those in Guatemala. And he said, how do you know about those? And I said, well, I shot one in the face. <laughs> His eyes got real big and he says, you did what? And I was like, I told him the encounter and, you know, his, I mean, his eyes kept getting bigger and bigger. And when I finished, he says, Adam, I believe you. I mean, I said, with all my heart, I believe you saw it and you shot it. He says, do not ever go back down there. And I'm like, why? And he says, because one of two things is going to happen, man, that, that Cadejo will uh, come after you or it will come to you. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, it, it will try to kill you. And I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. He says, my people, if they know there's one in the area, they, they don't, they don't go there. I'm like, okay. And I said, yeah, you don't have to worry about me going back. <laughs> I, said, I haven't been back to this day. And he's like, good, good, good. You know, just, just don't go down there. I'm like, okay. And, uh, yeah, he told me, uh, told me a little bit about it and how a few other things. There, there's another one that they've got down there. It, it's basically a Bigfoot. Like, I don't remember exactly what he said it was called, but, the guy on the episode may have said something about that too. I don't recall what he said about the uh, Bigfoot type creatures there, but, but yeah, he, he knew exactly what I was talking about when, when, when I said Cadejo. Have your encounters affected your ability to do anything most people take for granted, Adam? Yeah. I mean, I, I used to go hunting all the time. I used to, used to run a trap line. I haven't done that in, probably three or four years, my hearing is getting worse. And if I can't hear what's moving around me, then, you know, I don't want to be where something could happen to me. I look a lot closer at things when I'm moving through an area. You know, I pay attention to my peripheral a little more. I try not to have, you know, the woods directly at my back. I like to have some distance between me and the wood line if I have to turn my back to it. When I do go in the woods, you know, I, I go in with the mindset of, you know, I'm just passing through. Don't hurt me. I won't hurt you. I've heard people talk about how, you know, they'll, they'll go into an area and they'll get uneasy and they back out or they'll, they'll try to get in their, their head the mindset of, you know, I'm not going to hurt you. Don't hurt me. That's what I try to do. I mean, there's, there's areas here that you know, I start walking into and I'm like, nope, you know, I'll turn around, and go right back out. But then there's times that you know, I'll be somewhere and then, you know, like if I'm, I'm not fishing somewhere and then that uneasy feeling starts coming over me, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm, don't hurt me. I won't hurt you. And try to, try to keep peaceful thoughts in my head. So, cause I mean, animals are empathic a lot more than we give them credit for. And I believe this is a flesh and blood animal. You know, if it, if it was something, supernatural corporeal you know 44 caliber slug screaming out of the end of a revolver would have wouldn't have done anything to it. this thing screamed in pain and took off the other direction well like you mentioned earlier i wish you wouldn't have shot it but considering the fact you did i'm glad things turned out the way they did it could have gotten really ugly yeah yeah you know, i've kind of got a theory about why it turned and ran you know it, a lot of the encounters that i've listened to that they've actually thrown down on them and, and shot one like uh, uh brandon up in new york his buddy shot one in the chest with a shotgun and they saw the torn up flesh but it didn't seem to react and then there's i think there was another account where a guy was shooting one center mass with a nine millimeter but it looked like the bullets were bouncing off i'm thinking that you know they have extremely dense and hard skin dense muscle and Hard muscle is a lot tougher than flabby meat or flabby fat and flabby skin. And kind of what I'm thinking is, is they have like uh, their skin might be armored 
similar to like uh, you know, uh, you know, some animals, like like for example, like a rhinoceros or an armadillo. You can shoot an armadillo all day long with a twenty-two, and nine times out of ten, it'll bounce off. But they still have soft tissue, and soft tissue is still soft tissue, regardless of whether it's on their nose and a joint or an armpit, groin area, whatever. Soft tissue still. You can't have a lot of hard stuff in those areas, or they wouldn't be able to move as fast as they could. But that—that's my opinion on that. You know, if I had shot him in the chest, it probably wouldn't have done nothing, and he would have said, "Pass the ketchup." It's it's dinner time, you know. <laughs> but uh, I believe I hit him in an area that was, you know, soft tissue, and it caused a lot of pain, and he went the other direction. Well. Thank goodness he did go the opposite direction. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say. Having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here, Adam. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yes. Uh, Anybody that's listening, if you've got an encounter and you don't know if you should share it or not, please share it. I filled out my report on Vic's website probably five or six times, maybe even more, and Right next to that send button is a button that says clear form. I hit that clear form, I don't know, every time, except for the last time I filled it out. And I talked with Vic. He he got a hold of me within a couple days, and the the pre-interview was amazing. I I came out of that with a a lot better outlook on what happened to me and how to interpret what happened, and it, it really helped. Please share your experiences. Well, I'm so glad it did help you. But having said that, Adam, I want to thank you so much again for coming on and sharing all those experiences with us. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Vic. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. I'm so glad you did. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.